Especially of an animal in a wild state after escape from captivity or domestication. Alcatraz, Arab Spring, one billion rising. Freedom schools, the Maroons, rebellion thriving. We've been rising since the dawn of creation. Sun in the blood of our veins, liberation runs from Muhammad. Welcome to Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I'm your host, Anjali Nathupadia. We begin with a content note or trigger warning. Here at Feral Visions, we go deep, and that often means courageously addressing white supremacist, imperialist, heteropatriarchal, capitalist, settler, colonial violence in order to support healing and transformation. Bypassing isn't an option. The only way is through. The time for denial is over, and today's a great day to keep it real. Amidst the show's focus on unapologetic truth-telling, then, please practice excellent self and community care while listening. Welcome, folks. Uh, Feel free to get cozy. So excited to be able to be getting into the opening video of our autumn weeding and seeding series. So as we begin to get into it, I want to invite y'all, if you're down, to share three deep inhalations and exhalations with me. So for Liberation Spring participants, y'all are very familiar with us doing this at the beginning of our classes. And part of the intention there is just so that we can be a little more grounded, little more present if you're feeling it to see if potentially there's something you might be down to leave at the door to the extent that it's available to you so that we can really make the most of this limited time and energy that we've got together. So only if you're feeling it, if not, no worries. I'm going to pause for three deep inhalations and exhalations now. I always close my eyes. You're welcome to keep yours open or whatever you prefer. How about we pause now as we get going for three deep inhalations and exhalations? Appreciate y'all being down to take that time. And as we begin to come back together, so if you closed your eyes, you're welcome to open them up now. I'm just going to share a few introductory ideas since this is the opening video. Uh, So to begin to get into it, first off, uh, thank you all for coming through and for listening. What an honor to be able to be together in this moment, especially with all of the things going on. Uh, I invite you to get a notepad and something to write with, maybe a beverage, if you're able able to to turn off notifications before we dive right in. And also, if relevant, please don't feed any trolls. Uh, To give a little bit of background for folks who may not know me, hi, my name is Anjali Nathupadia. I'm professionally trained as a political scientist, as a philosopher, and as a professor. And so I've been teaching especially at the intersection of political science and women's studies at various university campuses and also in community for 16 years now. And so to give just a little bit of context for one of my intentions in wanting to offer this series this autumn, I'm sure that many of y'all are well aware 
a whole lot of our loved ones are really struggling right now, and clear perception and solid analysis can minimize so much unnecessary grief, diversions, and traps, us potentially tripping up where, frankly, we don't have unnecessary time and energy to be, be getting caught in the kinds of distractions that, frankly, we're swirling in right now. So instead, I want to encourage us to be able to redirect our energy a little more intentionally, which this moment certainly calls for. So I'm curious to get a sense if any of y'all feel epic differences between what you see in the corporate media and possibly what your gut is telling you, what your senses might be telling you, or maybe what your family told you growing up, almost like you're in the Truman Show when you sense that there's so much more to life and the world than what you hear people talking about, especially, say, on TV or on the internet. So in those moments, how on earth do we separate out what's legit from what doesn't deserve precious space in our mind anymore? We live in a dangerous time where knowledge and meaning are opportunistically contested and are being intentionally manipulated all around us on historically unprecedented scales. In that kind of oppressive and dangerous situation, how do we educate ourselves for liberation in the service of becoming the people the world so desperately needs? This series exists in part to help us heal our perception and trust the subversive or suppressed knowing and wisdom so that then we can act accordingly in order for us to move towards collective liberation. To audaciously know what you know, even if it's unpopular. Indeed, especially when facing truths that come with consequences. That way we'll be able to feel more confident in what we know, with humility of course, so that we can make bolder, more decisive moves as the change makers that our world needs. I want to support us in actively cultivating clear perception, as opposed to just reacting to the propaganda, corporate spin, PR, fake news, and biases that get flung in our direction. That way, it can be much easier to prioritize what we really care about, because we're not as consistently getting stuck in those diversions I mentioned earlier. So this is a collection of musings about the need for us to heal from something that I'm going to talk about more later this autumn called epistemicide, side like killing, right, femicide, genocide, insecticide, epistem, right, way of knowing, and we are dealing with, for over half a millennia now, epistemicide, the murder of ways of knowing that we actually need to be healing from to be able to even know what's up to then be able to act accordingly, right? So I want to talk a little bit about and see what y'all are sitting with related to how we can regain that kind of discernment. Some folks might call having this a great bullshit radar. That works also. So I want us to, right, come together to navigate how on earth it is we wade through these sort of topsy-turvy waters. I know it can be rare to have spaces in our everyday lives to have conversations about these kinds of topics yet they can be invaluable to access. So how about we get into some of our experiences and conversations about this topic, right? I know that many of us have devoted lifetimes to attempting to understand what's legit and what isn't. I know this is something that I've devoted a significant amount of my life to, and I also know a little bit about it because I've made plenty of mistakes in my own life around not being able to vet what is legit from what isn't. However, I am committed to not making the same mistakes repeatedly if there is any way that I can reasonably learn and evolve accordingly. So it's an honor to be able to share with you all some reflections based off of this field.
So one thing that I also want to mention before we really dive into it is just a little heads up. Truth and honesty are countercultural within the mainstream culture. So doing this kind of deep dive can shake things up. Things in our lives might change, our relationships might evolve, right? We might end up noticing things and making connections that we might not have already. And I know that many folks get ostracized, or we might have gotten othered, we might have gotten bullied, we might have gotten excommunicated from certain spaces as the odd one out or as being out there when we diverge from, it could be certain mainstream dynamics within the broader culture. Sometimes this could be, say, in a workplace, maybe within our family. And so when we out ourselves as caring about justice in this way, caring about caring, uh, and especially in such an apathetic space or in settings that are unapologetically oppressive, sometimes, right, that means that there are substantial consequences. So it's important for me to put that out there. I know that some of us might have come from supportive families or maybe even, say, activist lineages, but some of us have had to endure a whole lot of astounding feats just to be able to survive deeply abusive and unsupportive contexts. So if you have been made to feel right isolated or like you're always being pressured to not notice the things that you notice, right, or to not maybe rain on someone else's parade, so to speak, that's just kind of going with the right, the flow within the mainstream culture, this series is especially for y'all. Uh, it doesn't have to be lonely on this path of right, really honoring the wisdom that we're capable of embodying. Far from it. So I want to encourage us to recognize that we can meet new people on this journey of consciousness raising, of deepening our relationship with honesty, of evolving as living beings, of having respect for our potential, um, that we might not be doing the same exact thing with the same exact people in the same exact way forever. And that can actually be really exciting as an experience. What possibilities might lay in our future when we do do this kind of discernment that I'm talking about. So to be sure, I also want to acknowledge if we have been out of alignment in this way, like maybe just taking in storytelling that's super mainstream and spaces in the broader society to kind of realign in this way that I am inviting us towards can actually be excruciating. And so I also want to acknowledge sometimes there can be grief in moving from business as usual into deeper integrity. And it's also just important for me to acknowledge that at the outset as we dive into this series. If you ask me, it's important for us to be honest about that too, that we can readily anticipate that that might happen, right? That as we take truthfulness more seriously, <laughs> that might have reverberations in all sorts of different spaces within our lives. Um, so as we get into it, I do again just want to reiterate that I'm grateful for y'all's attention and for your listening and being in dialogue together. Um, I want to thank you in advance also for considering some of this material. Your attention is precious. I appreciate y'all taking this limited time and energy to devote to getting into some of this evocative material. So as we begin to dive into it, one of the things that I would want to encourage us to consider is actually a gift, right, that was given to us by the late, great Malcolm X. And so if you can see my screen okay, if y'all are just listening right now, I invite you to have a look. He gifted us with this quote, an idea that I'll read right now. If you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. So what on earth might Malcolm X have meant by that quote in particular? I'd like to give you all just a moment to pause and imagine. And if you have any sense, feel free to jump into the chat and to share. <clears throat> 
This is something that some of y'all who might have come through for Liberation Springs Spring 2020 course on revolution might remember that we talked about a whole lot. So especially within the context of the uprising that has right persisted as magnificently as it has, in the settler colonial US, but in other parts of the world also, and particularly, right, embodying dignity in the face of murderous white nationalism, right, in the face of the brutality that is always the institution of policing. What might it have meant and what might it mean for us right now in that context to take those words of Malcolm X seriously? So there were a few things in particular that we talked about, right? Again, I'll put this up for y'all to look at for folks that have just come through. Um, during this past spring, towards the beginning of this uprising that has been gifted to us in part by the Movement for Black Lives, uh, one of the things that I would want to invite us to consider here is the role that language plays in the storytelling that we take seriously. So there's a whole lot for us to unpack here and some really clear examples for us to have a look at that can illuminate what is so dangerous about the corporate media. So like some of y'all might remember that came through for our revolution class, I shared that. So I just about only listen to independent media um, and mostly get my news and current affairs from activist organizations and from local grassroots organizations and people that I know on the ground in different parts of the world to be continued this seeding Saturday when we talk talk about solutions and really formidable, amazing materials that definitely merit our taking super seriously. Um, but I shared this past spring in class that there was one time actually when none of my buddies, right, it was kind of late at night towards the beginning of the uprising, were doing live streams on social media or anything like that. And I really wanted to know what was going on in different areas. And so I, I don't want to say made the mistake, but I actually looked at a live stream that was on YouTube from occupied Tongva territory, specifically so-called Los Angeles. It could have been, say, KTLA. And it almost made me sick to my stomach hearing the way that a story was being told about this uprising for dignity, right? Stamping out, right, murderous white nationalism so that, right, all peoples and specifically BIPOC and most specifically black folks in the settler colonial U.S. won't have to deal with the murderous institution of policing as it has always existed within this nation state. Uh, and the language that was being used was so unapologetically skewed in a way that would discourage any understanding of the social movement itself as it was unfolding, and specifically in just unapologetically propagandistic ways in the service of capitalism. So what's one observation I could share, right? There was this pervasive use of the language of looting, right? Secondly, there was this pervasive usage of the language of rioting, right? Thirdly, there was this pervasive use of the language of outside agitators, right? And what's up with some of that languaging, right? So first off, this language of looting, one of the things that I would like to invite your attention to around that is, for example, with the CARES Act, right, or with the HEROES Act, or with some of the forms of legislation that just since corona has begun have literally been the largest transfer of wealth from poor and working class folks to corporations in world history, that's not really getting called looting, right, within the corporate media. And so we can see double standards there where everyday individuals attempting to survive amidst 
horrifically oppressive conditions are being judged, are being stigmatized, are being criminalized in this storytelling in a way that is very specifically punching down, so to speak. There's not room for a systemic analysis there. There's not room for institutional analysis there. And that really merits our noticing, right? And then secondly, how about that language of rioting, right? I could share with y'all another little right piece of my screen for people who are having a look on this right tip of double standards. So you might see here, right, there is this article that is called White Privilege on Display in Post-Super Bowl Riots. The reason I bring this up here is because, like I know many of y'all might have noticed before, white folks riot, quote unquote quote, on a regular basis, especially within the context of spectator sports, like in this case, right after the Super Bowl. And yet so often it's not talked about in that same super loaded language. And so that's another one of these forms of discernment related to double standards that I would sincerely like to encourage y'all to really consider. And also on the front of that language, of right outside agitators what's the function that that performs right so often it's actually deeply dismissive of pain right or of ethical indignation potentially of righteous anger in local communities, right? So it's deeply disrespectful in that way. Do any of y'all remember some of what this looked like, especially towards the beginning of the uprising? So commentators, right, or pundits in the corporate media would say, oh my goodness, look at these broken windows. There must be outside agitators, right, that are wreaking havoc in particular metropolitan areas or cities. And one of the the things that is, again, so damaging about that corporate media talking point is, again, it invalidates the possibility of people within a local area actually engaging in particular tactics or forms of protest themselves, right? So it's disempowering in that way. Now, it also definitely merits saying, for sure, sometimes there actually are outside agitators, like the Proud Boys, or like white nationalists, or like, right, informants, or like agents of the state, right? Agent provocateurs, potentially, and others. Uh, however, again, there is another one of these massive double standards at play that leads listeners in a particular direction at the ex uh, expense of actually opening up room for curiosity, right? For people to deepen their understanding of what's actually taking place. So almost like, right, with spectator sports more broadly, this encouragement to just pick a side, right? Talk about divide and conquer, right? Partisanship is a classic example of that divide and conquer mentality. It's almost like politics is just, right, a spectator sport, and you just pick one of two sides. We've only got two options, right? And then you just need to vouch for that side. Um, and that is just horrifically insulting to what we're capable of. And that really merits noticing, if you ask me. So just wanting to put that out there, right? So these three examples, looting, right? Rioting and this language of outside agitators being three examples of corporate media coverage of the uprising that actually, again, does just about precisely what Malcolm X, right, strongly invited people to take very seriously decades ago. So again, newspapers, but we could also talk about, right, other periodicals and other channels of corporate media. It could be a TV show, for instance, right, actively discouraging 
empathy with freedom fighters and instead actively encouraging people into this colonial capitalist mentality, right? Something else that, again, quite literally made me sick to my stomach when I was watching that corporate media footage, right, of actions towards the beginning of the uprising, the spring of 2020, was, and I hope y'all are sitting for this, and I'm sorry to have to even say this, it's so horrific, but it really merits naming They didn't even say why people were in the streets after George Floyd's murder. So if you hadn't heard about George Floyd's murder, you literally would have been led to believe by this kind of unapologetically biased storytelling. It was literally as if, and again, this was so unapologetically, right, classist and racist and colonial, just to be more specific, there was this right depiction, right? This footage also visually, right? From helicopters of hordes, right? Of people without any context at all whatsoever as to why people were even in the streets to begin with, right? And so these are just a few examples that we could talk about of so many others. And if y'all have any examples to share in the chat or maybe something you're thinking through, like, is this an example of that? Feel free to share, right? Those are just three instances to get us going, even just to really look at what's the language that's being used that's impacting the imaginations of millions of our loved ones and maybe might have impacted our imaginations also, right? Especially to the extent that we haven't gotten that up out of our minds to be able to take accuracy a little bit more seriously, right? So what does this reveal in part? If you ask me, right, one of the sort of vital lessons, again, that Malcolm X is gifting us here and that if you ask me is, just as relevant today, if not more, than it was when he shared this statement, especially because of corporate media consolidation, which we can talk about more a little bit later, um, is that, right, corporate media is going to be supporting the languaging, right, and the storytelling that supports the corporations that are paying their bills, right? And so particularly on that front, so whether it's Fox News, whether it's MSNBC, we could be talking about NPR, right? They've been bought and sold. It's important to acknowledge that just as much as, say, Fox, right, or ABC. Uh, there's explicit censorship that has everything to do with the financial bias of only covering stories that supports the agendas of their funders, right? So more on this later, because following the strings like that, right, attached to financial support, getting the receipts and taking them very seriously reveals a whole lot about what stories do and don't get told. And also, what perspectives do they get told from? And what perspectives do they not get told from? So another example of right this other piece that I want to invite our strongest attention towards is, right, again, following the numbers, right, getting those receipts and seeing, all right, hang on a minute. You mean to tell me the Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos, right, the CEO of Amazon? What's that mean in terms of the likelihood of the Washington Post airing anything that's critical of Amazon in any kind of substantial way, such as, for example, the way that Amazon has been willfully and deliberately, right, negligent in terms of providing basic workplace protections for workers in Amazon warehouses? Again, let's just think about this for a minute. All right. Washington Post is owned by Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos is the head of Amazon. We can anticipate from a mile away that there's going to be, right, this softball coverage to put it mildly, to put it kindly, right? So where are we going to go to be able to actually learn about how dangerous Amazon is, right, in shutting down mom and pa businesses 
all across the settler colonial U.S., right, in their sort of monopoly style overreach in terms of so many ways that they're so completely out of order, we can better believe that we're not going to find that from the Washington Post. And this is not just speculation, right? We can actually look to give thanks and more about this, right, during Seeding Saturdays when we talk about, right, critical media literacy, right? We can actually do a content analysis like many media scholars already have looking to Let's take, for example, the past year, right, all of the coverage of Amazon in the Washington Post and to see, right, are they actually asking critical questions? And if they're not, what's up with that, right? And who pays the price? And so this is one example that you might notice isn't partisan. Did you notice actually that everything I'm sharing right here is nonpartisan? So if people were coming from this divisive mentality of perceiving the world themselves, the cosmos, from this unapologetically partisan place, like the entire universe is just made up of blue versus red, us versus them, Democrat versus Republican, then that's a real limitation to critical thinking. So for example, some people that identify as liberals or progressives might not want to critically think about problems in the coverage that the Washington Post shares because they feel like in some very superficial way, the Washington Post is on their side. And so it's also very important for me to name that here because unfortunately, partisanship is a massive impediment to us being able to right, critically think and discern multi-directionally, whether it's someone that you agree with or whether it's somebody that you disagree with, whether it's a periodical or a news source that you perceive to, right, somehow be representing some of, right, your interests in the world or not. And one of the reasons why it's also incredibly important if you ask me for us to take that seriously is because so many people do unfortunately, right, just take sides in that very petty way, right, that doesn't actually honor our capacity for honesty, right? Again, thinking, for instance, that say, the New York Times, right, is somehow, right, more representative of, right, their interests ideologically or in terms of their worldview than, right, another periodical, and then that being a massive sort of impediment to their being able to critically think in this more expansive way that I am encouraging. And you know what's one of the consequences of that also? It, right, enables this kind of of echo chamber, right, um, division that we see in so many different spaces, right, some people talk about it as polarization, that just doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the sorts of, right, public intellectual dialogues, right, and engagement and discourse that we could be creating if we actually took honesty and truthfulness more seriously. Because if people are, when it comes to the corporate media, super into their channels and super antagonistically against other partisan channels, you know what that leads to? A situation like even in a settler colonial electoral sense in the last presidential election in the U.S., over a hundred million voters being like, this is all just really gross and corrupt. I'm over it. I don't want anything to do with this, right? And choosing to totally disengage from the system. And that, to me, actually merits looking at very carefully, right? So many folks that are so grossed out by that kind of partisan coverage that they check out of the system entirely. And I wouldn't be surprised if many of y'all might know a whole lot of folks that have done just that. I certainly know a whole lot of loved ones that are so entirely disgusted by this settler colonial, right, political charade that they actually just 
totally kind of tune out. And like I have mentioned to some of y'all recently, one of the things that I really want to invite us to take quite seriously is how dangerous that is. Right. And so that brings me to another piece that it's important for us to really consider, if you ask me, which is some right current affairs might be pretty intrinsically stressful. So, for example, when it comes to climate catastrophe, that's something that even if we're consuming independent media sources could certainly be, say, anxiety producing for many folks. Um, and so it's really important for me to acknowledge that first and foremost. Um, and additionally, that's actually all the more reason why. If you ask me, it's important for us to be right judicious in discerning what we allow to impact our minds in terms of the media right that we consume, because there are very legitimate right concerns in the world right now, whether it's right nuclear annihilationism, climate catastrophe, whatever it might be, an economic collapse. And so since this moment is so legitimately dangerous and concerning, and in some ways that are actually quite distinct, it's not just an extension of the same old, same old, it's an extension of the same old, right, oppression and injustice going back at least 526 years, but with some, right, historical distinction with some unique challenges also, that's all the more reason why I'd like to invite us to be, right, getting intel from sources that aren't just fear-mongering, right? So again, more around what that looks like when we talk about critical media literacy on Saturday. But more broadly, I'm curious to get a sense of what questions y'all might be sitting with right now related to the corporate media. Uh, and I can share actually, so let's see here, um, a couple of distinctions I would like to make. So also bringing in this topic of fake news that I know is something that a lot of people are concerned about and rightly so. So let's just Talk about fake news for a minute. What role does that play here within a broader conversation about corporate media? So I know that a lot of people might be concerned about fake news in part because it's right a phrase that the current president of the U.S. has promoted quite a lot. And one of the things that I would want to share specifically around that is, right, so a lot of people act like the idea of fake news is just something that Donald Trump recently created, or maybe even worse, that fake news doesn't exist. Like it's just something, right, a term that gets used to silence something that they don't want you to consider. Um, and if you ask me, that's actually a really problematic sort of misunderstanding of fake news. So I don't know if y'all saw, right, the dialogue that Arundhati Roy had that was put on by Haymarket um, with Nick Estes that was called, right, Azadi Freedom Fascism Fiction recently. Um, but there was a quote in it that I find incredibly relevant here that I'd like to share with y'all. So Arundhati Roy was talking about fascism um, based off of her new book on the topic. And here's what she said. She said, fascism, which we're experiencing now, adorns itself with fake news. Buckshuals laugh at the kind of corny fake history of the right, but they themselves have created a fake history. And then she goes on to talk about the role of the caste system right in South Asia, in the nation state of India in particular around that. And she says the dishonesty is unbelievable. I'm going to say that again, right? And again, it's really important to acknowledge here that if folks are coming from some partisan bias, they might say like, oh, the right wing is all about that fake news, but the left wing, leftist news, but the fake news is built on a fake 
history. And liberals and left-wing intellectuals laugh at the kind of corny fake history of the right, but they themselves have created a fake history. The dishonesty is unbelievable. Um, and this is, right, a talk that's based off of her new book that just came out on fascism. Uh, and so why would I bring that in here? Because it's incredibly important, if you ask me, that we acknowledge, right, that this phenomena of fake news that, again, some people have only ever started taking seriously within the past four years is actually based off of an erroneous history, say, in a place like the settler colonial U.S., since the history of the settler colonial U.S. So for those of us that are really here to heal our collective perception, we've got to be honest about that through line, right? That this isn't just some new phenomena. What's a classic example of that? And you know we're going to get back to this horrifying example of the New York Times right here. Who remembers, right, this idea of weapons of mass destruction? And specifically, who here remembers the idea of, right, weapons of mass destruction being used as justification for the U.S. military to wage an illegal war after the September 11th, 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center? Um, right, specifically weaponizing that notion within the context of Iraq and Afghanistan. So what was going on there again? All right, consistently for years, the New York Times lying, right, erroneously about this notion of weapons of mass destruction that to this day, the last time I checked, they have never even issued a retraction of. So what's a retraction, right, when a news source gets something wrong, typically, right, the headline's on the front page, and then maybe the next day or the next week on page 48 in fine print at the bottom, right, they'll say like, oh, we would like to correct this error from, right, two days ago. Actually, we were wrong about this thing. Do you see what an epically consequential example that is of what could get called fake news. And what's going on here, if we're to put this example in conversation with what I was inviting earlier, remember that, right? Get the receipts, follow the money, that can reveal a whole lot, right? If the corporate media is in large part, we can talk about who their funders are. And for specific shows, look at the commercials, right? Is it some pharmaceutical corporation? Then what's that going to mean about what they do and don't say about pharmaceutical corporations, right? Is it defense contractors, right? Halliburton, is it, right? Arms manufacturers, right? So if defense contractors and arms manufacturers or mercenaries, right, or the military industrial complex more broadly, right, are some of the substantial funders that are paying the bills of corporate networks or periodicals, like in this case, the New York Times, we have seen, we don't need to hypothesize Size, right, the track record of the kind of censorship that that encourages and forces, so that then, right, we could have how many, right, hundreds of thousands of, right, children in the Swana region, Southwest Asia and Northern Africa, murdered by the U.S. military within the past two decades. Right, or even just historical accuracy or rigor requires that we not be partisan, only looking at one side lying or one side being opportunistic in the stories that they tell and not looking in other directions. So that would be a massive example. Again, it's not just some little thing like 
you know, an article accidentally used the wrong year when they were talking about a certain historical event. No, we're talking about what do I mean when I say consequential? Like hundreds of thousands of people being murdered because of a lie being perpetuated by all of the major corporate media networks and channels in the settler colonial U.S. for decades on end that mean, again, hundreds of thousands of including children died in part because of that, right? Galvanizing public support for illegal wars and occupations based off of this kind of fear mongering. Um, and so, you know, that's one more example that we could contend with. Um, and that's also in part, right, what I imagine Arundhati Roy could have been referencing when she's talking about liberals and left wing intellectuals, right? wanting to criticize fake news and fake history on the right wing, but then not having the ethics or the integrity to also see, but yeah, where is your side being dishonest? That's also really important for people with integrity to take seriously. Uh, and so around that, one of the things that I would also want to invite us to consider is, like with the Amazon right example that I was getting into earlier, uh, so we know that Amazon has been partnering with ICE, with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, and so what is that going to mean when it comes to also the coverage of ICE or lack thereof, say, within the Washington Post. Um, and so this is another example of so many that we could get into to understand, hang on a minute, this softball coverage, right, whether it's knowing from a mile away the Washington Post is not going to right, publish a strong critique of Amazon, what does it mean if we let them get off the hook like that, right? One, we know that means people are going to be less likely to know what's going on. And then what might that encourage? In part, that people might be less likely to do anything meaningful that's going to be able to lead to substantial changes, like taking those tech bros down, for example, just to give one, right, of many that we could talk about. Uh, and so I know that's another massive, right, kind of consideration for us to be sitting with, like, what's the price of this kind of omission, certain questions not getting asked, right? Certain perspectives not being aired. And then also who pays the price of those silences or of those omissions within the corporate media? So just wanting to put that out there. Um, and I know that y'all have shared some great questions. So for example, Nikki here asking, could you talk about the strategy of Orwellian speak in the media, right? So do y'all remember, right, this idea comes from, of course, right, George Orwell's, right, classic text 1984, right, hence the term Orwellian. Um, and what in part, right, is that referencing when it comes to corporate media? So I don't know if any of y'all read that book when you were younger or if you've read it at any point in your life. I know I did back when I was a teenager. And you might recall, right, what is double speak specifically within the context of 1984? It's like this good is being portrayed as evil, evil is being portrayed as good, right? Or war is being portrayed as peace, and peace is being portrayed as war, right? And so we're going to talk about a whole lot of examples of being able to parse through some of that exactly on Saturday. But for right now, a little bit of what I could share around that would be do we want to talk about violence and policing? Is that relevant in any of the areas where y'all are tuning in from, by the way? Right? Like the corporate media sharing, right? If one pebble gets thrown in the direction of law enforcement, oh, this Antifa, I know exactly, picking up what I'm putting down in the chat. I know, Antifa fascists. Precisely, right? This idea that, uh, oh, the left so violent. Did you see there was a pebble that got thrown in the direction of this cop, right, without recognizing the intrinsic violence of policing, the inherent violence of policing, right? Law enforcement getting called keepers of the peace, right? Law enforcement getting called, right? Guardians of law and order, right? So you see how already that languaging, the languaging of violence in particular, is skewed 
in the most unapologetically capitalist direction, right? So we know that historically in the context of the settler colonial U.S., right, policing as an institution emerged, right, first and foremost, right, as Indian killers, right, as slave patrols, right, and as protecting private property specifically for, right, white settler slave owners, right? That's, if people aren't familiar with that history, please look into it so that we can move from this place of just talking abstractly about law enforcement to having any kind of historical integrity when we talk about cops. This is one of the reasons why, right, people that understand history are so often abolitionists because when you understand the origin of that institution, it lays bare how it's doing what it's always done, and it's working very successfully in the settler colonial U.S. right now. And so the thing about that is exactly, right, Beck's sharing when cops murder, it's like, quote, a person died by a bullet after police arrived to be big heroes, and quote, precisely, right, exactly, right, Grace sharing, calling out self-defense without recognizing the inherent violence of policing, right? And so, Nikki, you see how that would be an example of this Orwellian doublespeak, right? And this is one of the most classic examples of it, and especially that liberals can really freak out about this notion that the state right, like the federal government, right, and corporations, right, that can hire cops if they've got enough money, they're the only ones that have a legitimate authorization to utilize violence. But if anyone else is literally just trying to defend themselves, then no, they're the ones that are being violent. And you're not even allowed in the corporate media to question Right, that totally Orwellian framework. Um, and this, again, we see so clearly in the context of, right, these cop murders that so often that's literally, I mean, certainly in the case of, right, the grand jury, right, last week in the case of Breonna Taylor's murder, right, not even being charged, even in a carceral context, right, for being the murderers that so many cops are. Um, and so this would be one of the most consequential examples that we could look to right now. But also, and again, I'm going to share a ton of resources on Saturday, but I'll share one now because it's so important. Um, if you haven't seen the documentary Militainment, please watch that at your earliest convenience. So Professor Roger Stahl, right, um, created a documentary based off of his book documenting research of the same title, Militainment, right? You see how that's a portmanteau. It's a combination of the words military and entertainment. Um, and one of the things that he breaks down in that documentary in a way that's so important for us to be taking as seriously as possible is looking at this Orwellian doublespeak when it comes to the military and when it comes to talking about war. So there's all this jargon that is totally, what's the jargon? obfuscating, right? It deliberately, right, confuses us. So surgical strikes, collateral damage, friendly fire, and so on and so forth. Like friendly fire when someone on your side, so to speak, accidentally murders or shoots someone on your own side. You see how that idea of calling that friendly fire friendly, right? It's totally a euphemism, right? It minimizes the violence, right? Or surgical strike, right? It makes, or clean bombs, so to speak, right? It makes something that's horrific sound more palatable. So people are like, oh no, they're using surgical strikes. It's all good. Like I'm sure a hospital's probably not going to get bombed. Oh, I'm sure like a children's orphanage isn't going to get bombed because it's precision accuracy surgical strikes. You see, so the very language, especially when it comes to corporate media coverage of war and of right the U.S. military industrial complex is laden with this Orwellian doublespeak, right? Where you have bombs, like actual weapons of mass destruction, right, that are being, right, perpetuated, that are being promulgated, that are being spread by the terrorists of, right, the U.S. military industrial complex. Like Dr. MLK Jr. said, right, the greatest force of violence on the planet being the federal government of the U.S. and their military. Again, he got taken out. He got assassinated less than a year after he really started strongly critiquing the military. That merits noticing, if you ask me.
right? That coverage is steeped in, right? the kind of, to put it kindly, gaslighting that would have us think that there's anything precise or surgical or clean or friendly about that kind of murderous institution. And we know there are epic, right, um, intersections and coming together mutually, mutual constitution overlap of the U.S. military industrial complex and policing, right? So even if people were just super nationalist and they only cared about people within the borders of the settler colonial U.S., we can see, and super obviously for sure, since Ferguson, also Standing Rock, right, that U.S. police departments are militarized, right? It's like the Israeli Defense Forces trains, right? Um, and the School of the Americas, right? Coup creators, right? That have been designed for, right? Suppressing folks in the global south, so to speak, are totally turned inward, right? That happens when empires crumble, like is happening with the U.S. empire crumbling right now. Um, so that's one of the things to answer this question. At some point, could you talk about the history of the state and how that too is inherently violent like police? What are the parallels there? These would be a few examples of that, right? Um, so this notion of, right, settler colonial violence, right, both always already being internal to the settler colony, right, even the language of, right, Apache helicopters, and so on and so forth, right, the idea of, right, even labeling, right, so-called frontiers, right, internationally as opposed to domestically through this language of, quote, Indian wars, end quote, really reveals, right, some of those kinds of overlaps. Let me look at some of the other questions coming through. Yeah, um, so I have problems with extremely uncomfortable disgust after I'm exposed to most corporate media coverage. How do you cope with disgust about white supremacist colonial and capitalist spin on media? So for one, I'd say being boundaried and not letting it in to the fullest extent possible and the thing about that that's really important to acknowledge, if you ask me, is we're already waiting in so much of it. It's already internalized into so many people's right imaginations that they'll parrot it back, copying what they've heard pundits say and thinking there's something evolved or legitimate about that, that whatever we can do to boundary our precious minds from even more of that poison getting in would be very um, self-respecting and dignified, if you ask me. And again, that's not like, oh, you just want to be in your own echo chamber. That's a complete false equivalence. When we've been brainwashed towards, right, settler, colonial, imperialist, cis heteropatriarchal, capitalist, white supremacist biases and misunderstandings for much of our entire lives, right, within the mainstream culture, then it's incredibly important for us to recognize that that's already the foundation in most mainstream spaces that any dialogue is even premised off of, right? Um, the curricula is premised off of. So many of our loved ones' understanding of the world as their minds have been colonized are premised off of. And so based off of that historical and current context, then, right, doing whatever we can to not let more of that in to be boundaried on that front allows us to, right, get out, right, what is already within us, right, to allow us just a little bit of space to do some of that discernment. Um, and then also it allows us space to learn from sources that are more legit, right, that even if they're dealing with something that's horrifying, like climate catastrophe, at least it's not going to be laden with all of this fear mongering and manipulating our nervous systems for the sake of their short-term gains, for the sake of their ratings, right, for the sake of, right, and this so-called attention economy just keeping us glued to the screen so that they can benefit, right, in a way that doesn't actually support us being more informed, that doesn't support us actually being more grounded, that doesn't support us actually, instead of just being terrified and having a difficult time being able to go to sleep, actually knowing what's most relevant so then we can make informed decisions within our lives. Let me see what other questions have been coming up, because I think we have got a couple of minutes left. Where did this time go already? All right, let me see what we've got here.
the allure of capitalism and drilling it into us um, and some of our upbringings would be an example of loving the oppressor. Absolutely. We've been groomed, right, to have it would be kind to call it massive empathy deficits for oppressed peoples, for the earth, for the elements, for all living beings. Um, it's an epic example of what in psychology it's called the Stockholm Syndrome. Like someone has kidnapped you, your life is on the line, and all of a sudden you find yourself developing very fond feelings for them, right? Uh, and Diane Shrain, power structures always pushing their agenda, their view, exactly, right? Um, and so do you see how there, that's not just an example of, right, different perspectives or different positions, right? Because even within independent media, people are going to have their positions, right? So it's not like all independent media is always on point far from it. And we'll talk about a few very specific examples of that actually um, during this week's seating Saturday. But at minimum, they're not going to be beholden to, again, whether it's the pharmaceutical industry, whether it is defense contractors, right, arms manufacturers, right, mercenaries for hire, the military, and so on and so forth, the biotech industry, the tech industry, right? Uh, and so really merits taking seriously. Yeah, Diane sharing, I know, um, thank you for naming these truths. I know them intuitively, but something about hearing them in this way is empowering. I hope so. That's great to hear. Um, and let me see. Wow, can y'all believe we're already winding down in terms of time? Um, well, there are some questions that were sent to me that hopefully we can make some time to get into during seating Saturday. So I hope this has been supportive of encouraging you to turn it off wherever you can if you are subjected to any corporate media. Again, we're going to get enough of that bias talking to loved ones that don't have those boundaries. Uh, and so whatever we can do on that front to turn it off, even just as an experiment, you could dare yourself, say, just for the next month, and then to see what does that feel like, right? Do you notice any kind of shifts, whether it's in terms of anxiety, in terms of fear, right, or opening up access to have more time and energy to look to legit sources, right? Um, and so I'm going to be sharing a whole lot of those, right, and actually talking through on Saturday how I vet some of the resources that I consume myself. So not putting any of them on a pedestal, I definitely don't, but at minimum, they're not as horrifying, right, and as problematic as the corporate media. So I hope Again, what with Weeding Wednesday, we're pulling weeds. This has been an invitation to really pull the weed of the corporate media to the extent that it might have an influence on you um, and to be continued on Saturday in terms of some awesome solutions, if you ask me. So as we are parting ways, um, I really want to encourage you um, if you're able to, um, to pause for a moment. So especially instead of immediately continuing to scroll, just take a moment uh, to have some space to integrate some of what was just shared. Um, what does this mean for you in your life, right? If you understood some of what I shared and want to implement, I invite you to do so. See y'all. That's it for today's episode of Feral Visions, a decolonial feminist podcast brought to you by Liberation Spring. I've been your host, Anjali Nathupadhyay, and I thank you for listening. I'm also curious to know what this dialogue evoked for you. I invite you to post your reflections and questions in the comments section below to continue our collective journey of unlearning, remembering, and imagining. If you want to share feedback, such as segment ideas or potential guests you'd like to hear on the show, email liberationspring at gmail.com. And don't forget to follow Feral Visions on SoundCloud or iTunes, where you can find our show archive. If you'd like more information on this show's topic or to donate to the project, check out liberationspring.com. Thanks to Catherine Petru and Nicole Gervasio of our technical production team and Climbing Poetry for our theme song. Be sure to tune in for next week's episode. And in the meantime, let's make our ancestors proud. The power of the people is louder than the evil, deceitful and coward. People in power, all power to the people. It's the hour of the peaceful. Freedom is ours, yeah. Freedom is ours.